The Apostle James says, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. We begin by singing this morning. You'll find the hymn in these blue books at number 196. Number 196, praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. O my soul, praise Him, for He is your health and salvation. Number 196. Well, as we sit, let's join our hearts together in prayer. Let's pray. Our gracious God, we bow gladly in your presence, you whom we know to be the Almighty, the King of creation, reigning mightily above all things, and yet so wonderfully near, near to us, your children, whom you keep in utter safety, gently sustaining us at your side, 
following our daily lives with your goodness and your mercy and making yourself constantly to be our health and our salvation. How we marvel, Lord, at the goodness and the greatness and the wonder and the mystery of your redeeming love for us. Surely you are so abundantly good and generous in your blessings. We can scarcely begin to express adequately our thanksgiving. And yet, Lord, with all our inadequacies, we offer you the love of our hearts in the knowledge that you rejoice when we, your children, call upon you when in faith we seek you together to bring you that love and that praise and adoration that we long to give, however faltering, however feeble. You're a father, and you love to hear the voice of your children. You know, Lord, how each of us come to you this morning. You know the cares, the concerns, you know the fears and the sorrows in your people's hearts. And how we thank you, Lord, that all of these things find their rest in your presence and under your power. Yet, Lord, we pray that none of these cares and concerns that may fill our minds and hearts, that none of them would draw our minds away from our thoughts of you this morning. Would you tune our hearts, O oh God, together as we seek you, that we might seek your face alone, that we might cherish your words alone? Would you lift our eyes, we pray, again, that we might behold the beauty of your love to us. We might bathe afresh in the wonder of sins forgiven and the joy of the hope of our Father's house where we have been made to belong through the work of our wonderful Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So, Lord, fix our hearts and our minds heavenwards, we pray. Fix our hearts upon him who has brought us to life by his everlasting word of truth. And so may his word once again fill us with hope and with joy that we might go from this place strengthened, encouraged, enabled, equipped to be better disciples of our Lord Jesus and better soldiers of his gospel in this coming week of our lives. So hear us, our gracious Heavenly Father, and answer these our morning prayers. For we ask all in the name of your beloved Son and our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let me welcome you very warmly to our fellowship this morning. If you're up here and I can see you, or if you're downstairs, I hope you can see and hear us. But uh, either way, you're very welcome indeed. And uh, if it's your first time visiting with us here at the Tron, then uh, let me extend the welcome of our whole congregation. We hope that you'll feel very much at home with us as we meet together as a people of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me welcome also very specially this morning our guest preacher today, both this morning and this evening. Uh, we're delighted to have uh, Dr. Don Carson with us from uh, the States. Don has been with us this past week at the Pastors Training Course Residential, and uh, he's going to be <clears throat> one of the speakers this coming week at the Servants of the Word Conference, a conference for mainly younger ministers who will be meeting here Tuesday to Thursday uh, this week. Don, it's a delight to have you back here with us at the Tron, and uh, we thank you in advance for your ministry and for your warm fellowship to us. And I might say personally, Don has been a great encouragement to me in particular in the occasional times I've corresponded with him over these last months and this last year or so when we have been so grateful for the support and encouragement of many friends in far places. And uh, we're very grateful, Don, for your encouragement and your support. Let me mention one or two things that are on these sheets that you should have on your seats uh, or were given on the way in. Uh, there are a number of 
uh, events there, things going on in this coming week as usual, and uh, I simply draw your attention to those. Let me particularly pick out Wednesday evening when we meet here and have an opportunity once again to hear Don Carson preaching to us. That's uh, a chance for uh, the rest of us to join in, if you like, in the conference that's taking part this week. And you're all very welcome indeed at 7.30 on Wednesday. Do tell your friends, and if they'd like to come along, we are only too glad to be host uh, to others who want to join with us on Wednesday evening. As I've mentioned down at the bottom there, the Servants of the Word conference this coming week, do keep us in your prayers. Pray that that will be a time of real refreshment and encouragement for the many folks who will be joining together. Uh, Ministry sometimes can be a very lonely business. We're so fortunate in our congregation here with a large ministry team with so much encouragement one of another, but that's not so for many, many people. And uh, there'll be some hungry and discouraged souls coming this week. And perhaps you'd pray very especially that those who find themselves in that situation would be greatly heartened as they spend the week together with others uh, in ministry. So do remember us this coming week. Then on the right hand, let me flag up the Glasgow International Outreach. You'll remember that that happens every year about this time, and it will be going on for two weeks this year, not just one, beginning the 22nd of June. And you'll see there, there's a notice about uh, getting involved in that. And uh, if you'd like to know more, speak to Katie, and uh, she'd be delighted to uh, fill you in on that. But again, something for your prayers uh, for the coming weeks. Well, I'll let you read the rest of these and uh, digest them at your leisure, but uh, we're going to turn now to our Bible reading for this morning, which you'll find in the New Testament in the epistle of James, the letter of James. If you have one of our church visitors' Bibles, you should find that, I think, on page 1011, page 1011. Otherwise, it's right after the long letter to the Hebrews. And we're going to read in James chapter 1 at verse 12 and reading down to verse 25. James chapter 1 at verse 12. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, Slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness that God requires. Therefore put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in the mirror, for he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Amen. And may God bless to us this, his word. Well, we're going to sing again another hymn. You'll find it at number 737 in our hymn books. And if you're eagle-eyed, you'll see at the 
end of the hymn, the ascription is to Augustine of Hippo, St. Augustine, going all the way back to the fourth century. And this is a very ancient but very beautiful hymn that speaks of the beauty of our God, His goodness, and His wonderful grace. O matchless beauty of our God, so ancient and so new, kindle in us your fire of love, fall on us as the dew. Number 737. Well, we have a, a few moments of quiet now as our offerings are received. Perhaps uh, as the musicians play and the offerings are taken up, you might like to use the time to read again these words that we'll be studying shortly or re <coughs> read the uh, verses around them. But as we do that in the quiet, our offerings will be received.
Let's pray together. Our Father, as we bring our gifts before you, joining them with all the others of this congregation, we are reminded, Lord, of our responsibilities that you have graciously given us to be lights in this world, to proclaim the glories and the excellencies of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, to the ends of this earth. And Father, we rejoice in this privilege and ask that you would give us minds and hearts that never forget the mission that you have granted into our hands. May our prayers range, O God, way beyond merely our own personal lives and concerns of family, of friends, of the workplace, of our own congregation. All these legitimate things, O God, which you command us to come and bring before you in prayer. And yet, let us not forget the wideness of your mercy, the great extent of your love, which seeks and saves the lost in every part of this globe. Never let us forget, O oh God, the vision that you have laid before us of every tribe and tongue and people and nation drawn together by the one gospel of our one Saviour, the Lord Jesus. And so, Lord, we pray this morning for your world. We pray very particularly for places where there is so much strife and anguish, where nations are torn apart by bloody conflict and civil war. We hear increasingly solemn and dreadful news of the goings-on in the land of Syria, with increasing reports of the use of chemical weapons, with the fragmenting of that society and the disintegration of a whole nation. And, O oh God, we fear for the future not only of that land, but of the great conflagration that may be ignited in surrounding nations and in that whole troubled and fermented area of the Middle East. We pray, Lord, very particularly for Christian believers in that land caught in the crossfire and often finding themselves to be everybody's enemy and the butt of every attack. We pray, Lord, comfort and strengthening, a solid reassurance of the hope that is in the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray for physical succor for our dear brothers and sisters and ask, Lord, for your mercy to be upon them, for your protection to surround them. We think, Lord, of the land of Libya, <clears throat> so much out of the news now and yet in so many ways still a land deeply divided, not yet in any way built back into a place of stability and of the rule of law. We think of Iraq, <clears throat> and we do thank you, Father, for some signs of improvement there, and after so many years of conflict and of instability, the glimmerings and the beginnings of a stable society again. We pray, Lord, for those in power in that land, for all of those who seek to help them and to strengthen the rule of law and the establishment of peace. We similarly pray for Afghanistan, and all the needs of that benighted land with its uh, huge areas of lawlessness and of fear. Heavenly Father, we know not what to pray in so many of these situations in the world where our hearts are grieved, our minds are troubled, and yet we bring these things into your hand, the one who knows and sees all things, the one whose care is so intimate that not one sparrow falls to the ground but by your word and your permission. Lord, we ask for your mercy on this our world. 
And we ask, O God, that you would strengthen and equip and give courage and give vision to your church in all the world where our brothers and sisters, Lord, are facing daily the threats of bodily violence and even martyrdom. We praise you for the great courage and conviction which our brothers and sisters have so often shown and which puts us in this Western world to shame. Help us, O God, to be diligent in our prayers for them and in our willingness to where we can be true partners in support in tangible ways in their lives and in their ministries. We pray this morning, Lord, for our beloved friends in the Delhi Bible Institute and in their satellite centers right across the land of North India, remembering very particularly Ramraj David and his team in the center at Ranchi that we have had such a close connection with since its inception. We pray for these brothers, O oh God, and for their safety, living as they do, often in danger. We thank you for the way that in such a short time already you have established a gospel witness and work there, not only in church planting, but in systematic training of evangelists and preachers and planters. We pray, Lord, that you would continue to bless that work, to furnish it with its financial needs, to raise up men and women who will be able to teach your word to others all over the villages of the states of North India. We pray especially, Lord, for the plan for Abdul Samar, one of their center leaders, to come and join us here for a year, this coming year, that he might do Cornhill and apprentice with us in the fellowship. We ask, Lord, that you would pave the way for Abdul, that he would be granted a visa, and that you would help us to make all the arrangements that we need to make for him to be able to be with us. We pray that that might bring a strengthening of the ties in our partnership in the gospel and a real strengthening of his work as he leads that center in Derudun. We think, Lord, of our own land and our nation and our churches. In this week, O oh God, when the upper house of parliament has endorsed the government's bill to redefine the institution of marriage. We cry to you, O God, for protection and for mercy upon our nation and its people as one by one we seem bent upon systematically dismantling the foundations upon which this nation's peace and prosperity, its justice and its sense of morality has been built for millennia. Have mercy on us, O God, for as the foundations are chipped away and removed, how can the edifice remain standing and true? Lord, help us as Christian people to be rightly in prayer for those who bear the rule over us. We pray for Mr. Cameron and his cabinet, for the Houses of Parliament in Westminster and for our Scottish Parliament, for Mr. Salmond and his administration. We pray, Lord, that through pressure being brought to bear from the public and from those who would seek to stand for biblical truth in this land, that you would influence our lawmakers to see, Lord, that the ways of your word are not the ways of small-minded dogmatism, not the ways of reactionary traditionalism, but that your word, which laid the foundations of this earth, likewise lays the foundations for human society to teach us how it will go well with us and our children and our communities, and our society. Give us, we pray, O God, in the Christian church, the zeal for your word that we might live out so brightly the life that is in Jesus Christ, the goodness, the righteousness, the glories, that others would look to us and see in the church not hypocrisy, 
not a small-minded religious bigotry, but a health and a wholeness, a generous outgoing giving and a generous desire to help and to heal, that they would look upon your church and see the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ and look to our Heavenly Father and to seek wisdom in his word. So, Lord, to that end, would you help us as your people? We acknowledge, O oh God, our faults. We acknowledge before you our many sins and failings. We grieve, O oh God, that so often it is so easy for the world to look at the church with ridicule, to point to our failures and our sins, and to write off the message of our Savior. Forgive us, Lord. And teach us afresh your ways. Help us, Lord, that in our joyful obedience to the perfect law of liberty, to the wonderful ways that you have made ours in Jesus Christ, that we would shine like the stars in heaven. And even with our many faults, be unable to suppress the love of the Lord Jesus Christ from shining to this world. So, Lord, as we think of these great responsibilities you place upon us as your people, we're conscious so desperately of our need. And so we gather around your word this morning, looking to you for grace, looking to you for strength. Open our eyes, O oh God, that we may truly see wonderful things out of your law. Feed our souls. Strengthen our hearts and send us on our way to shine for the Lord Jesus Christ. For all that we ask is in his name and for his sake. Amen. We uh, continue in prayer now as we sing our next hymn on the screens. Our Father God who dwells in heaven, draw near and hear your children.
It is an enormous privilege to join you again at the Tron. I feel as if I'm coming home. There are so many links with this church and with its pastor. I do thank you for the welcome. I hope you will open your Bibles to James 1, but I'm going to begin by telling you stories of two men. Man number one, a Brit who some decades Bible College to prepare for pastoral ministry. In due course, he became minister of a church, and he seemed quite gifted as a speaker. He understood the gospel. Men and women were converted. The church began to grow, and then he was caught out in adultery and, of course, left the church. He seemed to disappear off the face of the earth. He surfaced in Canada at the seminary where I was then training. None of us knew his background. We graduated about the same time. I went to British Columbia to serve a church there. He disappeared into the wilds of Ontario. Some years later, I moved to Britain myself, and through the ecclesiastical grapevine, I, I heard that his ministry was flourishing. Then I heard that he was caught out in adultery, and he disappeared off the face of the earth. More years went by, and in the strange providence of God, I ended up where I am now, in Chicago. And when I first arrived at the seminary to teach there, the administration asked if I would mind helping out in a nearby church on the weekends, because they had recently gone through a trauma. Apparently, there had been a minister there who, though quite gifted, and it seemed quite a lot of conversions, um, nevertheless, he had got caught out in adultery and the church was in some disarray. Would I help out? Yes, your friend and mine, man number one. Some years later, if you asked him what happened, three times, didn't you learn anything? And why did you go back in the ministry in any case? What kind of ball-faced, crass boldness is that? He would answer, as he sold computer parts in Ohio. He would answer, God says that he would not leave us in any temptation beyond what we are able to bear, but will, with the temptation, make a way of escape. I wasn't able to bear it. God is a liar. And that's all he would say. That's man number one. Man number two, also a Brit. I mean, I want to give the impression that all Brits are like the first man. <laughs> His name was Norman. And in the 1930s, he went up to Cambridge from a devout family, was a fine Christian young man, became president of KICU, the Cambridge Intercollegiate Christian Union, married a young woman called Pat. They went as missionaries to Egypt, where he learned Arabic, then in World War II, he was drafted into counterintelligence in the Arabic-speaking world. After the war, he became the first warden of Tyndale House in Cambridge, and eventually helped to set up the Oriental Institute at the University of London. He was eventually knighted. And during his many, many years of ministry, he uh, preached evangelistically frequently and wrote not only his technical books in his own field, but also wrote many Christian books, a, lay, a layman with an immense uh, grasp of the gospel and evangelistic zeal. But not everyone knows about Sir Norman Anderson and his family. He had three children. The first was a medical doctor. She was serving as a doctor in what was then the Belgian Congo when the revolution took place in 1959 that made it Zaire. She was gang raped. She was furloughed home, and then as she recovered, she went to California to do some more medicine preparatory to going back to America. She tripped some stairs, knocked herself out, and drowned in her own spittle. The second child, a daughter, died in situations almost as bizarre. The third child, a son by the name of Hugh, died as an undergraduate at Cambridge the same year I arrived there myself in 1972. In all the years I knew Sir Norman, and I got to know him well. 
in all the years I knew Sir Norman. Not once, not once did I hear him blame God. Even when his wife was dying of Alzheimer's, not once did I blame God. So the question becomes, do you want to be like man number one or man number two? Don't answer quickly. It's easy to be man number one. But if you're a Christian, surely you want to be like man number two. And this passage that we've read together tells you exactly what the difference is. Number one, four things. Number one, when you are struggling under trial, remember the Christian's goals. When you are struggling under trial, remember the Christian's goals. Verse 12, blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. Now, in fact, this verse picks up the same theme from a little earlier in the chapter than the passage that we read. Go back to verses 2 and following. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So when you are struggling under trial, remember the Christian's goals. And there are, therefore, two of them. First, perseverance, endurance, stability. As an athlete endures to build up endurance. And the result of that is maturity. That's the point of verses 2 to 4. And the second reward, then, is found in verse 12. The crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. The expression is not common, but it's very clear what it means. In Revelation 2.10, be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. It is life in all its consummation, life in the new heaven and the new earth, life in resurrection existence, life to come, life in spectacular beauty and array. And in the light of sufferings and trials that we face here, that is altogether attractive. One recalls what Paul writes in Romans 8. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. In other words, when you are struggling under trial, remember the Christian's goals. If you are a Christian, you want to learn to persevere. You want to learn to be mature. You want to learn to be stable. And beyond all of that in this life, you look forward for the life that is to come, the life that will be consummated in resurrection existence, the very crown of life. And if the trials that come our way contribute to that end, you will say, as it were, yes. Yes, sufferings and trials I don't like, but bring it on. I want the goals. So when you are struggling under trial, remember the Christian's goals. When I was an undergraduate myself studying chemistry and mathematics at McGill, in those days all of us in the English language used the King James Version. And we had somebody come on the campus who was beginning a series of Bible studies on James. And in the first address, he came to James chapter 1, verse 2, which reads, Count it all joy, my brethren, when ye fall into diverse temptations. And then it runs on from there. Well, a number of us young men thought that we'd better take this seriously, so we made a little covenant together that any time we heard one of the others complaining or whining, we would quote this verse at them. Well, you can guess what happened. The next day, somebody wandered onto the campus and complained about the calculus exam scheduled for 10 o'clock. 
and another one would smirk and say, count it all joy, my brethren, when ye fall into diverse temptations, <laughs> which didn't help. <laughs> and someone else would complain, maybe he had just broken up with his girlfriend or something, or money was a little short that month. Count it all joy, my brethren, when ye fall into diverse temptations. And it, it became a, a, a kind of nasty bit of spiritual one-upmanship. I could say it to you more than you could say it to me. But in the mercy of God, gradually in that small group, it came to be heard as the voice of God. And complaints dried up. We started trying to think with eternity in view. And that year at McGill, we saw more converts than in all the rest of my years at McGill together. Listen, do you really want to be mature? Then as awful as some trials are, as awful as they are, not good things, part of this fallen order, understand this, God uses even such things for your good. And the goodness in its fullness is yet to be seen in eternity. When you are struggling, struggling under trial, remember the Christian's goals. Note even this little detail in verse 12. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. Alec Mateer writes in one place that when he was serving in ministry, an elderly woman died. She and her husband had been married for something like 60 years, but she died. And at the graveside, the old man who was left said, I suppose God has something more for me to do, else why would he have left me here? And Alec put his arm around his shoulder and he said, My dear brother, God has nothing more for you to do than to love him still. You see, he was not saying that the man really had nothing more to do. But we are not finally identified by what we do. We are identified by whether we love him still. So when you are struggling under trial, remember the Christian's goals. Number two, when you confess God's sovereignty, do not misunderstand God's motives. When you confess God's sovereignty, do not misunderstand God's motives. Verse 13, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. You see, that's easy to do if you believe in the sovereignty of God. Nothing falls, finally, outside the sweep of his sovereignty. So you actually face temptation and you start to think, God is tempting me. But the mysterious providence of God won't let you get away with a theology that's quite that reductionistic. Part of our problem in understanding this verse is that the root behind test or trial and temptation is one and the same, and context is everything. If I had to paraphrase the first part of verse 13, I would put it this way. If you are tempted by such trials, do not say, God is tempting me. In other words, James plunges from trial to temptation because he is writing as we experience things. The same events, the same Trials that are opportunities to go forward are also temptations to wallow in sin. Trial becomes temptation because it finds an answering cord within us. And then we blame God. After all, God does test people in the sense that he purposely brings them into situations where their willingness to obey him is tested 
In Genesis 22, verse 1, the Bible says explicitly, God tested Abraham in the matter of bringing Isaac to Mount Moriah and telling him to sacrifice him. We read in Judges 2, God tested Israel. We read in 2 Chronicles 20, 32, 31, God tested King Hezekiah. But although God may test us, even to bring about judgment in some cases, though he often tests us to prove his servant's faith, or to lower their pride, or to foster endurance, or even to prepare them for glory, he never does so in order to induce sin. In that sense, God does not tempt us. And the grounding of this truth, the truth of 13a, is in 13b. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. In other words, temptation is an impulse to sin, and God is not susceptible to any such impulse. God is not ever tempted. So why should we imagine for a moment that God would be interested in tempting us? It's ridiculous. No, a true account of temptation and sin is found in verses 14 and 15. Each person is tempted when they're dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after sin, after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Dragged away and enticed. The words are drawn from fishing imagery. Bait and hooks, enticed and hooked and dragged away. The point is, that as sweeping as the sovereignty of God is, it never functions in Scripture to mitigate human accountability. And here James insists this is a true reckoning of what temptation looks like. The desire itself is evil, but then sin itself is committed by an act of will, we assent to the desire, and the sin is committed. The imagery is stark and ugly. It's rather shocking, even grotesque. The mother is desire. She gives birth to the child, which is sin, and the child, full born, full grown, is death. The expression gives birth to death is, is, is shocking, shocking language to be full grown and stillborn. Today we would put it a little differently, but still with the same idea. You flirt with sin. You tease the desire. You perform the act. You establish the habit. You construct the character. And you are damned and enslaved by your own sin. At some point, as Spurgeon says, a man receives his masters in worthlessness and his doctorate in damnation. What James says is this. When you confess God's sovereignty, do not misunderstand God's motives. Number three. When you feel abandoned and crushed, do not forget God's goodness. When you feel abandoned and crushed, do not forget God's goodness. Verse 16 is transitional. Don't be deceived. My dear brothers and sisters, don't kid yourselves. Don't allow yourselves to wallow in rebellious self-pity or in an accusing stance. No, understand the truth, 17 and 18. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. Now, all of our experience of light brings with it shadows. The light in here is very good, and it comes from many, many corners. But the result is that when I hold my hand over this lectern, 
I see many different shadows. The light from there is casting shadows over here. The light from there is casting shadows over there. The light from there is casting shadows back here. And everywhere we look in the physical world, we enjoy the light, but something gets in the way, and there correspondingly is shadow. What James says is that God has no shadows. He's only good. If you like Star Trek or Star Wars better, if you like the Star Wars series, then you're familiar with the force. And the force is good or bad. It's light or dark. And which side of the force you enjoy, which side of the force you feed, really depends entirely on you. But that's not the way God is. There is no downside to God. We, amongst us, we, we, we look at people with certain strengths and, and, and certain uh, courageous features, and we think, you, you know, that's, that's their strength, all right, you know, but there's a downside to their strength. In, in this area, they're strong, but in this side, they're correspondingly weak. This person is bold and quick, but, you know, when it comes to sensitivity with poor people or, or weak people, they, they, they don't have it quite. This one is really compassionate and gentle, but, you know, really not a leader, and so on. It seems as if every good side has a bad side. Every bit of light has a bit of darkness. There are shadows everywhere. But with God, there are no shadows. He doesn't shift like shifting shadows. He is good. He can never, ever be not good. He is good, 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 good. There's no bad. He is only good. That means you cannot for a moment succumb to thinking that God is whimsical or mean-spirited or has it in for you or is on some little vengeance trip to satisfy a malicious streak. Oh, I know that the Bible speaks of the wrath of God 600 times in the Old Testament. But the wrath of God in biblical terms is a function of His goodness because it's not arbitrary or whimsical. It's a function of His holiness and He will see justice prevail. He is good, only good, which is part of the reason why Job, even in the midst of his inability to understand what God is doing, even in the midst of, of crying out for, for God to disclose himself, even in the midst of his uncertainty, can still say, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. You can't say that unless you're convinced that God is good. He is still trustable. Because he's good. If God were not invariably good, he would not be invariably trustable. When you feel abandoned and crushed, do not forget God's goodness. And what is the proof, the ultimate proof, that God is good? You could refer to the beauty of creation. You could refer to the storyline of God's providence disclosed in Scripture. You could refer to the new heaven and the new earth. But the author picks up the high watermark of God's goodness. Verse 18. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of firstfruits of all he created. What is this word of truth? That expression, word of truth, is found only five times in the New Testament. And every time, as far as I can see, it always means the same thing. It's most explicit in Ephesians 1.13, where we read, And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. So read verse 18 again. He chose to give us birth through the gospel that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. So the birth in view, therefore, is not natural birth. It's new birth. He chose to give us new birth through the gospel that we might be a kind of first fruits. And verse 18 then is establishing the point 
of verse 17. The proof that God is supremely and invariably good, he chose to give us regeneration, new birth through the gospel. And the gospel is the good news of what God has done in Christ Jesus supremely in his death and resurrection on our behalf. Are you suffering with cancer? And you wonder why God can allow it? Oh, we could talk endlessly about endurance and we all die and all the rest, but at the end of the day, what you most must hang on to is, but he regenerated me through the gospel. Are you out of work and don't quite know how the finances are going to work out and wonder if God really does care for you? But he regenerated me through the gospel. Have you been bereaved? Your husband or wife of many years taken from you? But he regenerated me through the gospel. Do you find yourself in conflict in the family, in the church? But he regenerated me through the gospel. What higher evidence is there of the goodness of God? The gospel in which the eternal Son bore our sins in his own body on the tree. The just dying for the unjust to bring us to God. And he chose to give us new birth out of that triumphant substitutionary death. And in eternity, we will look back on all of the trials of this world. And we will say, compared with what we received from Christ through the gospel, it was all so small. We made so much of it at the time. But it's so small compared with the glory we have received through the Christ who bore our sins. Through the gospel we begin to see what is of transcendental importance. And so, even when we cannot see the whys or discern very far into the purposes of God, and we cannot bring justification to our explanations, nevertheless, we still say, but I hang on to the cross because the ultimate evidence that God loves me is there. It's in the gospel. And that I cannot deny. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. It's the gospel that brings us stability in our utter conviction that God is good. And finally... When you hear gospel instruction, do not merely listen to it, live it out. When you hear gospel instruction, do not merely listen to it, live it out. Verse 19, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Now, when I was a boy, my father was a pastor planting churches in French Canada. 
and he tried to teach us the rudiments of faithful biblical interpretation. One of his slogans was, a text without a context becomes a pretext for a proof text. <laughs> so the question is, this repetition of the word word in verse 21, verse 22, and verse 23, to what does it refer? But you see, there has only been one mention of word so far in the entire preceding paragraphs. It's the word of truth, verse 18, which unambiguously refers to the gospel. That's what's going on in these verses too, and you will miss the impact of these verses unless you see that that is what is meant by the word. Therefore, verse 21, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word, the gospel planted in you, which can save you. And you think, wait, wait, wait a minute, Don. If James is writing to Christians, it's already saved us, hasn't it? Well, yes, yes, yes. But it's like quite a number of other words about receiving the gospel. There is a sense in which we speak of knowing Christ and also of getting to know Christ. The Apostle Paul certainly knows God, but he cries in Philippians chapter 3, oh, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable to his death. So also, if the gospel has come to us and we've received it, it has saved us. But there is another sense in which it continues to save us. The gospel is not that which sort of tips us in, and then after that, what transforms us is our discipleship courses. Rather, the gospel is the big category, and this gospel which has saved us, so we are acquitted before the bar of God's justice. We have been justified before Him. We have received the Holy Spirit. We have been regenerated. We already have life eternal. Nevertheless, it continues to save us as this powerful gospel transforms us and brings us in increasing intimacy with Christ and aligns us with, with the character of Christ. So what does the text say? Get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word, the gospel planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the gospel and so deceive yourselves. It's possible for Christians to listen to the gospel and say, as it were, well, I know all that. This is really good for all those pagans who are here this morning. I don't really need it myself, thank you. No, no, no. Do not merely listen to the gospel and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. The gospel is not only to be believed, it is to be obeyed. It is why 1 John can keep saying again and again, you must not only believe the truth, you are to do the truth. The gospel brings us Christ Jesus and his death and resurrection. And as we trust Christ and his death on our behalf, so Christ insists that we are to take up our cross and follow him, and we end up doing the gospel. Do you see? The gospel demands that we die to ourselves and rise in renewed faith in Christ Jesus. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word, to the gospel, but does not do what it says, is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and, and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom. In this context, with the flow of the argument, that must still refer to the gospel. It's the perfect instruction of God that brings genuine freedom. They will be blessed in what they do. Brothers and sisters in Christ, what will distinguish you from man number one? What will align you with man number two? When you are struggling under trial, remember the Christian's goals. When you confess God's sovereignty, do not misunderstand God's motives. When you feel abandoned and crushed, do not forget God's goodness. And when you hear gospel instruction, do not merely listen to it. Live it out. Let us pray.
We bow in your presence, Lord God, and beg of you wisdom from on high that is first peaceful, peaceable. You are the one who promises wisdom to those who ask, and we do ask. We hunger for the wisdom that enables us to see the gospel in all of its sweep and power. Draw us again and again to the cross of Christ Jesus and to the empty tomb. That our whole desire will be to die daily to sin and self and rise again in newness of life in Christ Jesus. And for those this morning who have gathered here for whom this gospel, this good news is still essentially alien, Will you not open their eyes, Lord God, enable them to see their need, to glimpse how utterly good you are as measured by the cross, and to cry out even now where they sit from their inmost being, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. For those of us who have walked the Christian way for many years, in some cases for many decades. Forbid that we should so be ensnared in difficult rumblings in our mind regarding the mysteries of providence that we forget the clarity of Scripture on the glory of your goodness. But bring us back again and again to trusting, adoring, obedient worship for Jesus sake amen well we conclude this morning by singing number 256 Number 256 in our hymn books. God moves in a mysterious way, his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. Number 256.
Well, now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with you all now and always. Amen.